This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, in your ear holes for another, well, let's just call this a shorty. Hi, everybody. I made a big mistake. It turns out when you put in or upload a podcast into your, you know what? It's just magic. I had put our podcast in to be distributed on Sunday night, Monday morning, as I always do, but I had unintentionally selected the wrong date. So if you missed out on this week's episode, it is in the feed right now. It is called Bears, Bees, Battlestar Galactica. So you can go back and find that right now, but I felt really bad. So I'm putting this out for you. It's a shorty. It's a repeat of the Great Chicago Fire, how immigration and religion kind of fueled the fire, as it were, of the myth of the Great Chicago Fire, how this cow was framed, and what this cow has to do with the Chicago Public Library system. Turns out we have a cow to thank for one of the largest public library systems in America. Let's go back and listen to the story of Mrs. O'Leary's cow, segment two from episode three. And you're going to hear it's going to sound very different from our current episodes. It turns out that, uh, you know, your art evolves and you get more comfortable with it and you find your language and your lingo and your tone. And I had none of that back in episode three. So it's going to sound a little different, um, but the information is all still there and I hope you enjoy it. So I'll see you on the other side. The scene, 1871. Old timey hats, horse-drawn carriages. Cars won't be invented for another 14 years. Oh, and wood. Everything was built out of wood, which turns out is not the best material to have an entire city built out of during one of the worst droughts in American history. And not only that, but the streets and even sidewalks were lined with wood. Wood, wood, wood everywhere. And dry cow poop because animals pulled carts and carriages. And Chicago was also a town known for animal trading and slaughterhouses. Dried manure is actually a decent fuel source and quite flammable. Everything built out of wood during one of America's worst droughts prior to the 2000s. And then add a barn with two tons of hay and two tons of coal for people no doubt preparing for a long, cold Chicago winter right around the corner. They didn't have central heating, so coal and flamey things were just how our ancestors survived. What we have here is a perfect storm for the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. I live in a city. Country kids understand what acres are, but city kids? We talk in blocks. So how big is one acre? One acre is 90% of an American football field or 16 tennis courts in a 4x4 formation. So when I say 194 acres in just one of Chicago's three divisions burned, that's 194 football fields or over 194,000 tennis courts in just one division. There were the three divisions, as I mentioned at the time, 460 acres in the South Division burned and left 21,000 people homeless. And Chicago's North Division was the worst hit. 1,470 acres were burned. 13,000 buildings were destroyed. When our city has one triple-decker go up in flames, it is a tragedy. In total, a third of the city of Chicago ended up without shelter and homeless. 300 people lost their lives. 
And the guys at the Stuff You Should Know podcast did an entire episode on this topic, and they suggested to go to Google Maps and search for the Great Chicago Fire in Maps. This shows you just how great and how large this fire was. And Chicago wasn't the only city to burn that day. There were several massive fires in the area, including Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Oh, and Ontario, Canada. Chicago had a fire the day before that firefighters fought overnight and into the morning of the fateful fire. So the fire teams were already exhausted, hadn't eaten or slept, and then this fire and the rumors started to spread. So why are we talking about this on an animal podcast? Now, some of you might have heard the story that Mrs. O'Leary's cow started the fire in Chicago. The story goes that Daisy, Madeline, or Gwendolyn, depending on the tale, knocked over a lantern while Mrs. O'Leary was milking her. The fire started in the barn and the fire spread, thanks in part to the city's dry conditions, wood everything, including the streets, and dried cow poop, which exacerbated the fire. Fire trucks and air support teams, as we know them today, did not exist. In addition, there were strong winds that fed the other fires through the area too. And since the fire burned so quickly and the water pumping systems went down, destroyed any chance of getting this fire put out early on, and it only added to the devastation. There seems to be little debate as to where the fire started. It started near or in the O'Leary's barn. But that long-told story, the story of the cow, was completely fabricated, made up, fake news. The only thing that spread faster than the fire were the rumors that started before the blaze was even out. Mrs. O'Leary was an Irish immigrant, and anti-Irish sentiment was at an all-time high in the 1800s. Additionally, she was a proud Catholic, and that was also an easy target at the time. Some of this might sound familiar in today's political climate. The more things change. It's clear the fire started here or near the barn. We know for sure they did not have gender reveal parties, so that wasn't it. And we also know that it wasn't the cow knocking over the lantern, as reporter Michael Ahern was the reporter to first put that on the front page. But over a decade later, Ahern came clean, saying that he made the story up, but the cow stuck. And Mrs. O'Leary died a few years after the fire in 1895 of acute pneumonia and of a broken heart. She spent the rest of her days defending herself, her beloved Daisy, Madeline, or Gwendolyn, depending on the tale, and the weight of a city's grief lay unasked and undeserved on her shoulders. Can you even imagine 300 dead and a third of your city burned to the ground and everyone blamed you because you were an innocent, easy target? So if it wasn't Daisy or Madeline or Gwendolyn, depending on the tale, who was it that caused the fire? It was likely children gambling in the barn or a man named Daniel Pegleg Sullivan who liked to visit his mom's cow at night. I'm not going to ask any more questions about that. That cow was housed in the same barn as the O'Leary's cow. But if it wasn't them, it would have been someone else. In addition to the wood, the cold, the hay, the drought, the wind, there was already fires the day before in Chicago and the fire department was exhausted. And with the dry conditions, fires existing everywhere else in the Midwest and in Canada, a single spark was waiting to ignite the tired, dry city. An ember from a cigarette, a spark from a chimney, It would not have taken much, and it would have happened somewhere else in the city if it weren't for the O'Leary's barn that night. The irony is that the O'Leary's house did not burn. So how did this cow, a cow who didn't even start this fire, become infamous and synonymous with the destruction of an American city? Well, the news of a city falling due to a frisky heifer continued to spread, no doubt in part to the devastation. But the cause of the fire erroneously pointing to a milking cow? It is silly, right? It's unbelievable. But in part, because of the attention the framed bovine brought to the story, city governments immediately improved building codes to stop the rapid spread of future fires. And they got rid of the whole let's make streets out of wood thing, which was a great idea. And other governments got involved too. London proposed an English book donation sending 8,000 books and money. And with it, Chicago was able to establish a free public library. And while that might not seem like such a big deal, it was. Prior to this, you had to pay a membership fee to use the library. Can you imagine? So that's how a framed cow inspired one of the biggest public library systems in the United States. And just a funny, perhaps not well thought out epilogue to this tale. 
in 2014, the city of Chicago and Red Moon Theater partnered to create a Great Chicago Fire Festival. Ironically, the event suffered from technical difficulties as replicas from the 1871 houses on floating barges in the Chicago River failed to ignite properly due to electrical problems, of which they didn't have in 1871, and heavy rain, which they also didn't have in 1871. Admittedly, I think this is probably for the best. So that was the second segment from way back when, way back in episode three, titled Mrs. O'Leary's Cow. And also in that episode, we had learned about a couple of other things, too. We had learned about how crocodiles can gallop. They are way faster than you think. And we learned about a goat who kind of got a police officer into trouble. But thank goodness for her body camera, you know, because it turns out if you tell your boss, hey, somebody ate my homework and that someone is a goat, people aren't going to believe you unless you have a body camera. So good thing that she had that on. If you are interested at all in hearing the rest of that episode, go back to episode three, Mrs. O'Leary's Cow on bewilderbeastpod.com. And you can listen to some other podcasts about this as well. There's the Stuff You Should Know selects Did the Cow Start the Great Chicago Fire? And also Stuff You Missed in History Class also had a great podcast on that as well. So go back and listen to those. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the stuff every other podcast tells you to do. Now go get curious, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.